Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined from Tampa, Florida by Dr. Patrick Newman, a fellow of the Mises Institute. How are you doing, Patrick? Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and Patrick is Assistant Professor of Economics at the Florida Southern College, a fellow of its Center for Free Enterprise, editor of Murray Robart's The Progressive Era, Mises Institute, 2017, and fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty, The New Republic, 1784 to 1791, also author of Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in Early America. And what we're going to talk about today is the Austrian School of Economics and why it's relevant to solving current economic problems and building a sustainable economic uh, environment. So, um, Patrick, just for, for people who may not be very familiar with the Austrian School of Economics, uh, can you just give kind of Cliff Notes version for people? Yeah, sure. So Austrian, uh, Austrian economics is what's known as a heterodox. Uh, school of thought. So it's considered outside the mainstream or what's known as neoclassical economics. And very briefly, Austrian economics uh, emphasizes the, the role of the entrepreneur in the uh, structure of production in the economy. So how all of the capital goods basically work together. And it uh, generally uh, espouses or, or the, the Austrian economics uh, promotes uh, basically a, a sound understanding of the economy that basically uh, leads to free market conclusions. So it, it's skeptical of government intervention. It says, look, let entrepreneurs work in the, uh, in the work allocating capital goods to where they best uh, see them fit and uh, have government stay out of the way. And this is really just kind of a like a snapshot uh, view of mm -hmm. Austrian economics. So it's just big on the entrepreneur and it's skeptical of government intervention. Yeah, and uh, and obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of economics flying flying around today. But at the Austrian um, school seems to have, as you said, seems to be being pushed a little bit out of the mainstream. Why do you why do you think that is when it has that focus on? I mean, say in, even in in the US, which is you know classically people would say was set up for the entrepreneur, but even here it it uh, it still seems to be outside the mainstream. Whereas it would appear that it would fit perfectly. Uh, for a U.S. model, yeah, the uh, this, this is something Austrians have discussed uh, over and over again because Austrian economics used to be considered uh, fairly mainstream, uh, really up until about the 30s and 40s. Uh, some Austrian economists have won Nobel prizes, most famously F.A. Hayek in 1974. Mm -hmm. And you might think that okay, in a country where the entrepreneur is 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 championed. Uh, that Austrian economics would, would have a uh, find a friendly home, and unfortunately, and that's not the case. Uh, without getting too much in the history of economic thought, uh, a big issue with entrepreneurship from the perspective of mainstream economics is it's hard to formalize the entrepreneur and put it in a mathematical model. Uh, something mm -hmm. the Austrian economists emphasize is that entrepreneurs act in a world of disequilibrium, a world of uncertainty, a world of forecasting, of constant change. And that's something that is hard to fit into economic models. So the entrepreneurs just simply cast aside. And in addition, uh, there are a lot of economists that uh, make their bread and butter, so to speak, by working with the government or by providing various forecasting and statistical analysis for the government. And a school of thought that is generally pessimistic on the effects of government intervention is not likely to find a friendly home among academia, where so much of uh, their income is from uh, directly or indirectly from the government. Mm -hmm. So um, from from an Austrian economics point of view, if you were to uh, offer a solution maybe to our, our economic woes and, and uh, our recurring economic woes, because we just seem to lurch from crisis to crisis, what, what would some of those ideas be? Mm -hmm. One of the theories that Austrian economics is most famously known for is Austrian business cycle theory, which in a nutshell argues that when central banks expand the money supply and they engage in expansionary monetary policy, they artificially lower interest rates. This misleads entrepreneurs, causes them to embark upon projects that look sustainable and look profitable, but they're actually not profitable. And they're not able to finish these pro uh, projects or have them 
remain profitable because the, mo uh, the money printing causes inflation and mm -hmm. then the central bank has to contract. So this is something that uh, at least uh, is arguably uh, very relevant for today's world because since COVID, governments tremendously increased the money supply. A lot of economists, mainstream economists in particular, thought that this wouldn't lead to inflation. Uh, in 2021 and 2022, we had very high inflation, really, mm -hmm. not only in the United States, but around the world, uh, since, you know, it's the highest it's been since the early 80s. And now central banks are uh, basically engaging in a tightening campaign, raising rates, uh, contracting the money supply, and so on. And this is causing various economists to worry about a hard landing or a recession. Uh, which is what Austrian uh, uh, business cycle theorists would predict. Um, and a, a, a big uh, um, cure or a uh, reform that Austrian economists would advocate is to actually get central banks out of the um, uh, out of the uh, the money supply, get them divorced from financial markets and really get rid of central banks because it's this type of it's their type of monetary expansion. Um, that leads to these problems in the first place that causes these unsustainable booms and busts. So that's one reform Austrian economists would advocate. Austrian economists are very anti-central banking for the reasons I just outlined. Yeah, and uh, and obviously um, that's exacerbated now by central banks starting to talk about cryptocurrency, and which obviously um, will allow them to manipulate uh, the money supply even more or have that extra level of control. So in some ways, it seems like some people are advocating for going even, even further in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Over the past couple of years, we've seen a, a lot of uh, hype and talk about alternative currencies, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, so on and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, you know, they, they, they had a meteoric rise over the past couple of years. And then Basically, uh, since the, the the threat of inflation and higher interest rates and various other problems, those uh, a lot of those uh, assets have declined. But um, many enthusiasts of Austrian economics are, are big proponents of cryptocurrency because they're seen as alternative monies that can compete with central banks. And central banks, such as the Federal Reserve, are a bit worried about uh, increasing use of cryptocurrencies because uh, this would lead to a decline in the demand for the dollar. If people actually start using Bitcoin or other current, uh, cryptocurrencies in daily transactions, and it would also lead to a decline in tax revenue. So uh, a lot of um, economists, Austrian economists especially, um, but other enthusiasts of you know other promoters of, of cryptocurrencies, et cetera, are sort of anxiously awaiting, one, what's going to happen to the price of uh, these assets in the near term future, and then are governments going to take um, uh, punitive uh, measures against these types of uh, alternative currencies to prevent them from being adopted. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and one of the one of the key things uh about the Austrian, you know, philosophy as you said at the beginning is the focus on the entrepreneur, the individual as an entrepreneur and and as you said that runs and that doesn't fit neatly into like say that uh, the homo economicus or those um type type of type of models. So talk to me a little bit about what what characterizes the the entrepreneur in in the Austrian context? Yeah, that's a great question, because when you hear the word entrepreneur, people can come up with a million definitions. Sometimes people think of, well, they're an inventor. They're coming up with a new product. They are an innovator, uh, they, you know, et cetera. Um, and you can get all you can go on various definitions of entrepreneurship about this, you know, regarding this. So Henry Ford is an entrepreneur because he invented the automobile. Mm. An Austrian economist it's a little bit different uh, to the Austrian. The entrepreneur is really the, the owner of the business uh, or the owners uh, that uh, saves and allocates resources in the uncertain future. So they're really a forecaster. So an mm -hmm. entrepreneur who own, uh, you know, someone who owns the car company, they might not actually have any day to day involvement in inventing new cars or new types of technology. But they're the ones trying to figure out, OK, will consumers actually buy this? Is this profitable to produce? Will we get something that will last, uh, will generate us revenue for a significant period of time? So really, the, for the Austrians, the, the entrepreneur is someone who is trying to uh, you know, bear the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, be a forecaster of uncertainty and be a risk bearer 
trying to mitigate against potential losses in earned profits. Yeah, and let's face it, I mean, that has run contrary to a lot of what has been uh, championed over the last, uh, I should say, couple of decades. But, you know, the idea of building a business is like taking on lots and lots of investment money, uh, investing in hyper growth, not not worrying about the bottom line, not worrying about a path to profitability. And then you come to uh, a, a you know recession or, or neo recession right now. And then suddenly everybody starts going, oops, we need to we need to have a solid business here. We need to have a path to profitability, and most of them can't can't find it. So um, that that has been a trend, though that has been championed, and I think those uh, those chickens are coming home to roost right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been a lot of errors, I think, um, uh, that, that that have been made regarding entrepreneurship, especially recently. Uh, you know, oh, entrepreneurs shouldn't focus on profits; they should focus on other metrics or uh, you know, really, that's not the main thing uh, to, you, to be a successful entrepreneur. You, you, you don't need to look for profits or that's not the number one thing. Or uh, entrepreneurship is something that can be taught uh, and it's not something that can it's really learned on the fly or learned from your own experience in running a business. And I think that's uh, th that's unfortunate because uh, really the, 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 the entrepreneur is the most crucial uh, you could say in the economic system because they're the ones trying to forecast what consumers want they're the ones making the judgment call right they're using their judgment one entrepreneur might think this production process will be profitable another entrepreneur might think it won't be profitable which one of them is going to turn out to be right well that will depend on how well they forecast what consumers want so on and so forth and these are the men and women who really power economic growth because they're allocating scarce resources according to how they think consumers will value them. And uh, we, we don't want to lose sight of that because if we lose sight of that, then we're misleading a lot of people as to what entrepreneur, yeah, what an entrepreneur is and, and, and what they do and what they don't do. Yeah, and uh, no, absolutely. And, and the other thing, too, is, I mean, obviously, we're in, um, you know, there's war and conflict in in the world. And it seems to me that, you know, that trade and all of that, you know, being used as a weapon rather than being used as a way, we would say, you know, um, you know, salespeople engage in trade. So they're peace providers and uh, prosperity agents, right? So um, if the, if the Aust under the Austrian economic ideas and models, um, relations between countries, uh, it's, it's much more on an equal footing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So yeah, Austrian economists are big uh, exponents. You know, they 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 are big propounders of the uh, proponents, excuse me, of the division of labor, of specialization, mm -hmm. comparative advantage, and and why this uh, really leads to a very strong case for free trade. So a decrease in tariffs and other restrictions that block the free flow of goods and services. Uh, between countries, and and really, uh, the Austrians would say there's there's no reason why America should produce everything, or why we need to move away from globalization. Instead, this actually leads to uh, better quality goods and lower prices if we uh, have some goods that get produced in Asia, some in Europe, some in South America, etc. Each person should specialize. Each person, each region, each town, country, etc., should specialize in what they're best at. And the, the job of the entrepreneur is to, of course, figure out what those uh, specializations are, what countries are, are better at producing certain things, and, of course, investing accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, which and kind of runs contrary to, let's face it, the experience under globalism to date, which has been just like outsource everything, like move everything away, decimate and don't focus on, you know, leave those places that used to produce things behind rather than, as you said, focusing on on what they're good at and what people are, are good at, because that leads to greater connectedness. Um, so, um, you know, how how can how can people start to look at the Austrian uh, approach differently and how can they start to bring it a little bit more mainstream? Well, like what needs to happen for it to come back into vogue? Because clearly the models we're using right now are, are just leading to either, you know, greater inequity, devastation of traditional, you know, communities and, and quite frankly, war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
the the the, a lot of people would be feel very negatively about globalization more more recently they'd say well following free trade just leads to all sorts of problems austrian economists would say that well a lot of those negative effects aren't really caused by free trade or even the cause of of outsourcing may be due to the fact that the united states would have higher regulatory barriers or higher taxes Mm -hmm. for the longest time we had a very high corporate income tax, uh, the highest among the world, uh, other sorts of regulatory barriers regarding labor policies, environment, et cetera, that makes it more uneconomical to produce those goods or continue to produce those goods in the United States. And this is one of the reasons why we've seen um, this uh, destruction of manufacturing in the United States is simply uh, we've uh, we've made ourselves uh, uncompetitive, or we, 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 we've managed to make other countries more efficient at producing those goods through our own laws. And it's, it's one of these things that I, I think it kind of the segue into your, your next point. Mm-hmm. Austrian economists, in order for them to receive better recognition by the mainstream, in order for them to have their ideas be advanced more, we really have to see some, some sort of change in the intellectual environment as well as the educational environment more universities, more colleges. Uh, You have to start seeing more people appreciate uh, the Austrian ideas. You also have to see people uh, talking about these ideas more in, uh, you know, just regular discourse in the media, et cetera. And this is going to uh, require just more people becoming educated, more people learning about these ideas. We have to see more people um, actually caring more about economics. A lot of times people don't care about economics until things get really bad. So I think the chance of Austrian economics receiving a greater uh, mainstream recognition is going to go up depending on what happens in the current economic climate. If we do enter in a recession very soon, this will vindicate the Austrians and make their ideas uh, more pl- uh, more accept- uh, acceptable to uh, a, a large swath of the population. Yeah, because it's very interesting what you just said there, though, about uh about globalization, because as you say, yeah, it's got extreme negative connotations, but a lot of those are because of the things that were surrounding it. And I don't think a lot of people would understand that, say, outsourcing of manufacturing maybe has very little to do with the manufacturing, has maybe a lot to do with, as you said, with regulation, with taxation, with all of these other things. So, this kind of globalization is creating un- unequal competition, right? As opposed to uh, opening for real free, ta- free trade for real competition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's important to understand that the, the trend towards globalization over the past, say, 50 years or so, uh, is, is, is there, there's some factors that are outside of the United States control. Of course, I'm referring to, say, China moving away from a very communist society in the 1970s and increasingly moving towards a, a at least a more uh, free market economy, at least uh, relative to where it was before. Similar things happened at, after the, the Cold War uh, with a little bit with the, the former Soviet Union, though that seems to be reversing uh, more recently. You've also got India, which has greatly liberalized its markets over the past 40 years and, and so on. But a lot of the the trade deals, et cetera, that we have uh, negotiated has also been associated with various forms of government intervention people don't know about. Uh, to move to a slightly different uh, example, you can think of the European Union established mm-hmm. sort of a free trade uh, area um, among uh, most of Europe, but that's come with additional costs in the form of greater centralization of, 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 of government power and a loss in the and, and more state relatively like uh, pro, uh, state and local power, at least in, uh, at the European level. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have to recognize those and actually see, OK, what caused uh, this effect on in the, on the world? A lot of times when people see something bad, whether it's in, you know, some sort of environmental problem, inequality, a business cycle, inflation, a pandemic or et cetera, they blame capitalism. And right. Austrian economists are always quick to point out that, no, it's not capitalism that's caused this. You've misunderstood the problem. It's, 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 it's actually the government intervention A, B, or C, right? Mm-hmm. And this is part of the general trend, the, the general thrust of a lot of Austrian economists is you have to educate people. People have to understand right. actually how the world works. Otherwise, they're going to criticize things that a- actually aren't causing problems. 
uh, and that's going to be an incorrect diagnosis. It's going to lead to incorrect diagnosis. Yeah, no, 100 percent. And I know from my own home country, Ireland, uh, when it went through its uh, the financial crisis, that was one of the things that had no control over its own interest rates because it was all controlled by the European Central Bank. So it had to take measures that were dictated to it as opposed to have the autonomy to do it itself. Um, so um, one last thing, uh, uh, Patrick, if there was one book or one resource that you would advise people, you know, to take a look at, maybe people who are clueless, never heard of it, maybe you've heard of it, but don't understand the Austrian School of, what, of Economics, what, what book or, or resource would you recommend? Yeah, so there's actually the, the, the Mises Institute of where I'm a, I'm a fellow at. Mm. They, they've recently come out with two books. Uh, one of them is by Pear. Per Bieland, uh, it's about how to think about the economy, and this is a sort of an uh, introductory uh, introduction to Austrian economics. And the other one is by Bob Murphy, and it's Understanding Monetary Mechanics. Uh, mm. And um, th th those are great books to uh, to look at if you're interested in Austrian economics. You just want a, a a crash course in Austrian economics. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. And we'll include the links to those books uh, below this video. Um, Patrick, before we go, do tell people a little bit more about the work you do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a professor, uh, assistant professor of economics at Florida Southern College. So it's right outside of Tampa. And I do a lot of work in both Austrian economics as well as economic history. Uh, that's at least where my, my, a lot of my research lies. So I, I focus a lot on cronyism or special interest policies currently working on a multi-volume history of those types of policies in the United States. And uh, in addition to that, I also do a lot of macroeconomic forecasting. So um, I, I do forecast, I provide consulting work for various companies about where I think the economy is headed and all of that. And, uh, you know, what's going to happen to inflation and so on. So I'm kind of involved in a, in a bunch of stuff. And I'm always working on something. And you can, you can find me at, on Twitter at, at Dr. Patrick Newman. Um, and, or you, or you can always shoot me an email. So, uh, I like, I, I, I live, breathe, uh, eat and sleep economics. What, what can I say? Perfect. Well, you know, we need more people to do that. People who actually take yeah. a, take a longer term view. Um, listen, thanks again, Patrick. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon.